I like to think of philosophy as a set of tools that you can apply to any discipline, right? And that in any discipline, if you start thinking carefully about the nature of that discipline, you're going to end up doing philosophy anyway. It's, it's useful, but that doesn't mean it's, it's true. I mean, right. sometimes we, we, uh, we conflate these, right? So it is almost the burden is on me to explain. I mean, if I'm going around telling people that this is a bad way of thinking about organisms, right? Then the first question I'm going to get is, why are we still using it if it's so terrible? Basically, what I want to do is try to listen, to attend to what physics tells us, mm -hmm. okay, instead of engineering. And what this physics tells us? Well, it tells us that organisms are flows of energy and matter. So I'm not naive enough to think that we can get away without using any metaphors, okay? Right. Even though I'm very critical of the machine metaphor, I recognize that metaphors are indispensable. This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, I'm Paul, and that was Daniel Nicholson. So Daniel is a philosopher at George Mason University. And I say philosopher, but he's just as much a historian, really, as a philosopher. Dan considers it um, essential to understand the historical roots and traces of the philosophical issues that keep cropping up again and again, often without um, acknowledging that these ideas are old and that many bright people have already addressed them. And we should pay attention to the work of those bright people rather than reinvent the wheel again and again. So we talk about Dan's approach. Um, we talk about process philosophy, the notion that a better way to understand our universe is as a collection of processes rather than a collection of things or substances. We discuss Dan's work arguing against what he calls the machine conception of the organism. And that's the view that we understand organisms mechanistically uh, and reductively, like machines, um, much like the computer metaphor of the brain that you're probably familiar with if you listen to this podcast. And we dance around a bunch of other uh, subjects, like his interest in artificial life, which is part of the full episode available to Patreon supporters. You can learn how to support the podcast uh, and the different bells and whistles that uh, come with that through the website at braininspired.co. And you can also find the show notes uh, there at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 150, where I also link to Dan and his works. All right. Enjoy Dan. Dan, we, we were just talking about uh, our academic histories, and you're a ex-molecular biologist turned... W w would it be right to say biological philosopher philosophy of bi philosopher of biology yeah or you could even broaden that up even more to historian and philosopher of biology i do sort of integrated hps as it's called hps yeah so i was mm -hmm. telling you about my decision to quit academia and and how i did not turn to philosophy like you did but perhaps i should have mm -hmm. and you know I, I said i was in a postdoc my postdoc lasted about six years and you said your uh -huh. yours was about you did 10 years worth of postdocs yeah, about that, almost, almost a decade. And uh, I mean, I enjoyed, of course, having the the autonomy to do whatever I wanted. I mean, even when I was part of a of a funded project, I still had reasonable amount of, of leeway to to you know to, to to pursue that project however I wanted. So that was really good. Um, but yeah, it was obviously very unnerving to not know where I would be next. And uh, well, so I did my first. My first postdoc was um, was at the KLI. It was in uh, near Vienna in Austria. It's this sort of institute for advanced studies, where basically you come and you can do whatever you want, and it's a wonderful place. You got all these resources, wonderful spaces to work, uh, library, um, funding to travel. But you need to stay in the lab uh, if you're a molecular biologist. You got to stay in the lab, man. Well, no, I mean, so the story of me leaving the lab is comes much earlier. I I, I thankfully learned really early on that it wasn't for me i mean oh. i enjoy i love biology i love molecular biology i'm interested always been interested in sort of the you know life the nature of life and uh, um and that inevitably led me from higher organisms to lower organisms and ended up doing molecular biology because those were i guess the it's the simplest the simplest point of the, to, to begin that process of understanding life and um but yeah i, I just did not enjoy the lab work at all it found it extremely tedious uh, you had to be like very good with your hands, and I was always like pipettes, a lot of pipetting, lagging, lagging behind. Like yeah. everyone else was, you know, in the in the practicals, the seven, the the, 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 the those 
horrible seven hour practicals in, in my degree. I, I, I just was always behind and uh, I wanted to talk about this stuff, you know, uh, discuss uh, the issues. And I noticed that the people just don't really do that. At least they don't do that when they're working in the lab. They might do that when they go out for a drink after. Right. And I figured, well, wouldn't it be lovely to be able to do to do that all the time? You know, the stuff that, that these people do, these scientists do, you know, after when they take a speaker out for dinner or when they're reflecting, right? Uh, wouldn't it be great to be able to just spend most of your time doing that? And uh, I didn't even know there was a discipline called philosophy of science or anything like that. I just... Uh, That's cra- I isn't that crazy? Accident. That so, so many yeah. scientists have no purchase on philosophy at all. I know. And it's it's such a shame because it's a discipline that is by its very nature right in the interdisciplinary and it needs the input, right? You need to know the science. It's 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 I think uh targeted to scientists. I mean if we, it's not we're not doing a good job if we're only talking to each other, right? <laughs> of course we have our own journals and we yeah. and we are the ones who are reading each other's work, but ultimately there has to be some contact with uh you know with the scientists. Not everyone agrees by the way. Some people think that uh it's perfectly fine, fine to have this sort of a second order discussion, which is completely divorced from what's going on. Like, you know, we're commenting on what other people are doing, but I, I've never, I never bought that. I always thought that the whole point of me doing this work is that in some way, hopefully in the long term, I can have some influence on, on what, on the actual science. Yeah. I guess that the reason why I think that is because I don't really think of myself as doing something completely different from science, right? Maybe you can think of philosophy of science as doing science by other means, you know, you're not in a lab, but you're still thinking, you're reading the literature, you are doing, you can do critical work, right? You don't have to be commenting on what others are doing. You can take a stand, you know, have a seat at the table, uh, engage in the debates that are going on in the science, right? And if you, if you talk to them and you publish in their outlets, then there's no reason why philosophers of science can't contribute. And many of us have a science background anyway. Yeah. So I don't see why, you know, it's like, um, it's like what theoretical biology used to be, you know. So I'm, I'm interested that I'm, at the moment I'm doing a engaged in a project looking at the history of this discipline, right? And mm. it's very interesting because most people have a terrible opinion of theoretical biology because it's associated with mathematical models uh, of particular biological processes, and usually the mathematics comes first, as it were. And most biologists who are very practically minded, very experimentally minded, don't see the relevance of theoretical biology. And it's such a shame because. If you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, 100 years ago, when the discipline got going, it was all about, you know, conceptual clarification, uh, discussion of, uh, you know, ideas and theories and their relation. It's all the stuff that we philosophers are doing now. Um, So maybe it's time to take back, reclaim theoretical biology as something that can be Mm. as useful to biology as theoretical physics is to physics, you know, a, a discipline that can provide some sort of foundation where you don't, you know, you don't learn necessarily through doing experimental work, but you, you, you can, you, and you don't even need to do math, right? It can be sort of non-formal theoretical work, conceptual clarification, things, and these kinds of things. But is that, not, is is that philosophy or is that theory? What's the that, well? That's the that's the, the nice line. thing about it. Yeah. I mean, when you are not able to distinguish them, I think we're we're going somewhere, right? Mm. But we when we say, well, is this philosophy? Is this theory? Well, this is exactly the kind of space that philosophers of biology should be taking. You know, the space where it's not clear, the space where um, it is it is beneficial to have someone, one of us, right, in, among, among a group of bio- biologists, right? Because even though we're trained differently, uh, we can still contribute to those sorts of discussions. You know, biologists need us, right? They need a clarification. We have no idea, for example, how to define a gene, right? We have no understanding about <laughs> what level of description we should uh, focus on when trying to explain complex phenomena. So it's not like something, you know, they're doing philosophy anyway, right? They just are not aware they're, of it. Yeah, right. Why not just, you know, take, uh, ask for a helping hand from those of us who who may be able to provide some, some assistance. You, you've mentioned that you, you know, read the literature. How much of the literature that you're reading is biology and how much philosophy what's the what's the uh, ratio uh it's a good question depends on the on the projects i'm engaged in to be brutally honest with you i i don't um find much of philosophy all that interesting i have to say Um, (laughs) ouch (laughs) well we can edit that out we'll edit that i'm just kidding that's that's (laughs) fine i mean uh, philosophy it's just such a weird discipline because it's not i just don't even see it as a discipline it's it's you can have philosophy of everything, right? Philosophy mm-hmm. of art, philosophy of history, philosophy of music, philosophy of science. Philosophy of, gender, of course, you got philosophy. Yeah, 
a- anything, right? Yeah. And plus, of course, ethics, aesthetics, uh, you know, metaphysics, epistemology. So um, I like to think of philosophy as a set of tools that you can apply to any discipline. Right. And that in any discipline, if you start thinking carefully about the nature of that discipline, you're going to end up doing philosophy anyway. So, you know, you could imagine a world where philosophy departments dissipate. Right. Or if they don't disappear, they become grossly reduced. And what happens is philosophers of law end up talking to people practicing law, philosophers of politics end up talking to, you know, and and you could imagine that situation. Right. And, And a few people. Are in, you know, a few of my colleagues are in biology departments, for example, and I know philosophers of physics sometimes are housed or in, in, in physics departments. And I think that's, uh, that, that wouldn't be a terrible thing if that happened, mm. right? Um, because uh, when I think about the work that my colleagues do in my department, I mean, it's an extremely diverse department, as philosophy departments tend to be, it's, right? It's also boring. And it's your, difficult. Your colleagues work. It's, no, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that, but, uh, but it's difficult for me to find points of contact. Right, see, right. Right? With what, I mean, what do I have in common, right? Uh, uh, um, whereas if I'm in a biology um, context, right, I may not be uh, doing the experiments, right? But I am able to ask interesting questions and to, and to learn a great deal. Uh, from what the kind of work that they're doing. So in that sense, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, huge swathes of philosophy are just not, um, I mean, at least in the research level, right? And when I teach, of course, it's different. Um, I'm not, frankly, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not reading that stuff. Um, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to anyway, right? If I wanted to do this kind of work, which mm-hmm. is so interdisciplinary. So, I, so, you know, in some projects that I've done, I've, it's been almost all um, science, and in others, it's been mostly it's mostly philosophy, right? It also depends on the target audience of what I'm writing. I've tried to be very deliberate and very intentional and clear in my mind before I start writing. Am I writing? What I'm going to write is this going to be consumed by yeah. philosophers or biobiologists or by historians? You know, so it really uh, that that will determine the how I use my time. When's the last time you walked into a wet lab and? Uh, who does consume? Are, are are you making that difference in science? Are you connecting with the scientists? I last time I I did any lab work was no. Uh, I just walked. I'm just thinking oh. like afterward, you know, walking into a wet lab, what it must feel like that you're free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Um, <laughs> I so many of my colleagues are very skeptical that philosophers of science can actually make a difference. They have a pretty pessimistic view. But honestly, that hasn't been my experience. Mm. I've had a, a great experience with scientists. I've always found scientists, for, for the most part, interested, you know, and almost like uh, amazed because, of course, they don't know that there are people like me doing this kind of work. You know, but, and, but, and so they, yeah. But how very, many kind of just try to uh, brush you off? You know, like uh, um, it, I mean, it does happen, but not mm. as com- not as often as many philosophers say that it mm. happens. Right? It doesn't happen that often. I mean. What they want, what scientists want to know, first of all, is that you're not talking out of your backside. That you know what you're talking right. about. And if they, if you make, if you, if you show any indication that you can follow the conversation that you, that you are, you know, reasonably scientifically literate, then, then my experience is that they've all often been interested in what I have to say. Now, of course, the sorts of questions that you get in the Q and A uh, at the end of a, you know, of a talk when the talk is delivered in a biology department, yeah. say. Are very different from the sort of questions <laughs> that I get in a philosophy department, right? So philosophers are trained to think critically, to um, you know, to scrutinize every argument, right? So at the end of any so, you know philosophy colloquium, you're going to get people who are going to try to disagree with you, right? Yeah. Even if they actually don't disagree with you, because they're just trying to test the argument. Uh, you, you know, you may know for a fact that your friend standing, you know, sitting in front of you agrees with you, but there they are in public, you know trying to destroy your argument right. and they're doing you a service. You know, that's how it's understood in philosophy. Yep. It's a good thing because it, they, they're giving me the opportunity to think more carefully about how I would defend the argument and how I would respond to objections that may come up. So, so that's considered So think about that, right? That's even considered a service. Well, right? that, that's the same in, in science, science though. Re- that, that's the same um, uh, between well, it, scientists. There's a similarity there. But as a, bio, as uh, well, a philosopher I mean, in, my, in a science department, perhaps it's different. Uh, I mean, my, my experience... Talking to scientists is actually that some scientists are, are, are don't I mean don't ex- necessarily expect there to be um, sort of um, conflict. Uh, I'm, again, you know, mm. I'm just speaking sort of secondhand. Um, also, it happens in uh, you know in in in, in, public, in, in papers, right? So my, I've had experiences of 
scientists being upset when they <laughs> when they read a paper that's just come out that is this, this, that is you know criticizing their work, whereas yeah. a philosopher is delighted because it gives you the opportunity. So I mean, mm. maybe there's a cultural difference there, maybe not. Mm. But the point is that if if I then give a talk to a science audience, then the questions are going to be all like, uh, okay, that's fantastic, very interesting, it got me thinking in any way, but how do I translate this into something sure. I can actually do, sure. implement in my lab? Yeah. How, how does this matter to my work? And that's a question that never comes up, you know, in philo in, in philosophical, uh, with philosophical audience. So it's kind of nice to, to always remind yourself that the kind of stuff that, that one does, if you want to be, you know, to, to have an impact or, or be read by scientists, you have to never forget that there has to be some sort of payoff that can be something that can be implemented uh, practically, which, which is the same. Most philosophers don't ever worry about. And do you prefer that sort of uh, feedback, those, that, that biological Q&A, like how can I apply this, or is it more challenging, and is that better or worse? It's more challenging yeah. because I'm not, I mean, I'm not that interested in open up. <laughs> well, I mean, of course I'm interested, but that's not what I'm doing, right? right? I mean, I see it as a division of labor, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I like to think about, about pro conceptual problems I hope that you as a scientist can find a way to to draw on those reflections in your work. I, I feel a little bit, it's a bit odd to, for me to to tell, you know, the scientists what they should do. Right. I don't know enough, right? It seems like I'm out of my depth if uh, if they ask me, you know, well, okay, how do you, um, how do you adopt a process perspective in the lab? Okay, so that's, or, uh, you know, questions relating to, to, to my work. So uh, it can be very challenging. And I know I don't always have a good answer to, mm. to those kind of questions, to be frank. So, you know, you, you've talked about reading a lot of uh, literature. I know that you read a lot of historical literature because history is almost central to your philosophical endeavors. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Why is that? And, and then I, I really want to know, like, how you... Uh, choose what to read, how you, your path in reading the history, how do you mine for these ideas yeah. that are connected to what you're trying to write about? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, for me, it's always seemed natural uh, when thinking about science to, to, to think about the evolution of the ideas that I'm dealing with, mm -hmm. right? So it's almost unnatural. Uh, I mean, I could almost throw the question back at the sort of a historical analytic philosophers who don't really care about history. I mean, how can you possibly think about causation or think about, you know, emergence or mechanism without looking at how that debate has unfolded over time? It seems almost, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's naive. It's, it seems almost Why? a bit arrogant, right? To think, well, because, because there's a huge number of people <laughs> who have thought about those same issues, yeah. probably smarter than us, right? Who have a great deal uh, that we can learn from, right? Uh, maybe the specific context, of course, is different, and you know, we we obviously, depending on the question, if the question is 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 narrowly formulated, then 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 maybe much of the history of science is not that relevant, right? Because we they didn't know the, what we know now. But philosophical questions don't tend to be very narrow, oh. right? They tend to be quite general, and conceptual, right? So um, so there, you essentially have an entire sort of cemetery, right, of forgotten ideas waiting to be rediscovered, dug up and, you know, cleaned and, and reused, uh, because obviously the alternative is just to continuously reinvent the wheel, which, we which, do. which unfortunately yeah. happens. Yeah. Which have, and so I've always had that um, sensibility towards history. And, and uh, I think that, I mean, I, I can't imagine doing philosophy of biology without also doing history of biology, because it helps me situate the debate that I'm engaging in it also reminds me that the way we are addressing a problem is not inevitable. The way we're addressing it now is not inevitable. It's a consequence of, of, of contingency, you know, choices that were made at particular times, that there, is, uh, there are a number of different ways we can think about an issue, right? And often these are, have already been explored historically. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've never, I'm different from a historian because, of course, historians are interested in the history for its own sake, mm -hmm. right? They're interested in narratives. You know, you read a history paper and it begins like, you know, on the October 4th, 1863, this person, you know, did and that's not how philosophers think, right? Philosophers are interested in trying to solve problems, mm -hmm. right? But the history there comes in uh, by, I say, as I say, affording us uh, maybe forgotten uh, strategies to deal with those problems, right? And so I think in that sense, it's extremely helpful. And the answer to your question about how to know what to read, well, you just, you just follow the... 
I, is you it just, it's just, the same? Because so if I if I want to learn about process philosophy, I can go to your book, Everything Flows, right, and read your chapter, and then you already have all the history laid out. By the way, uh, uh, do you know the band Teenage Fan Club? No. Okay. There's a. Uh, I think it's a UK band, kind of old. Maybe I think I'm older than you, but uh, they have this. This what, my favorite song by them is "Everything Flows." Back when they were a good band. <laughs> anyway, so I really like the title of that book. But but if I want to learn about you know the history, I can just go to your chapter in in the book "Everything right. Flows." And so what you just said is that you just kind of um, follow the dots. But are the dots laid? So in let's you know like in neuroscience or biology, you can do that m- right. more easily, it seems. But these buried ideas. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that the dots have been connected through time already, right? Well, the thing is that if you read my chapter and you're interested in the uh, in the evolution of the ideas that I'm discussing, you may not necessarily agree with the survey that I offer. I mean, any historical survey is a is an incredible subjective act of selection of sources, right? Yeah. You innumerable sources are suddenly all it's all boiled down to a couple of pages, right? Uh, not only that, but you know how I discuss them, how I connect them. It's You could have a hundred or a thousand people looking at the same sources and they would all come with a different mm. account. So in that sense, uh, you don't have to trust, take my word for it. You know, I'm also using history. Uh, it's always, it's always a, cer- a means to an end, right? So if you have a different agenda, you may look at the authors that I'm looking at in a different way, right? So the question is, well, which of the two interpretations is right? Historians often, are, for that reason, are quite unhappy with philosophers like me uh, digging their noses into their history uh, because, well, you know, for one thing, they think that they have that they own history, and I completely re- disagree with that. You know, they think that it's their turf, and we shouldn't <laughs> we shouldn't you know try to to uh, to make <laughs> to intrusions there. I totally disagree with that. I think that history belongs to all of us, and we, including scientists, and that we we, we will all benefit from from context, you know, from understanding. Uh, because, you know, the answers may be there. I mean, what you want to say, which may be, you know, 2022, 20, may in some sense already be in a, <laughs> encapsulated in ideas that were proposed uh, decades, if not centuries ago. And I have happened to me. I mean, and when I was doing my my PhD, I, I discovered this, this basically this, this movement, this intellectual movement in the interwar period, the 1920s, 1930s of authors, in different countries who were developing a view of the organism, which was the view that I wanted to defend. Are these the, the organicists? View that I wanted to defend. Yeah, the yeah. organicists, right? So the view that I wanted to defend in the context of 21st century discussions was a view that had been developed by very, very smart people that have been completely forgotten for a number of interesting reasons uh, 100 years ago, right? Yeah. And so me reading this work is almost more valuable than reading the literature that is being published today. Because, oh, wow, okay, of course. You know, they didn't, they didn't know this, but look at how they, look how they addressed it, right? And so... I see a lot of my work is trying to essentially revive this movement, which of course is a cycle, right? Because they thought they saw themselves as reviving earlier scholars, right? And it goes it goes on and on. Yeah. Uh, it's, so you know, in that sense, we're all part of this of this grand conversation, and and this analytic sort of Anglo-American, um, you know, culturally this this this. Um, this 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 way of doing philosophy, where one thinks that the history is completely irrelevant, one should only focus on arguments, I think is a little bit myopic because mm. it's uh, I don't know. It's like you're choosing not to uh, avail yourself of all these other resources that the, that are there. So I have to ask you about this because we're talking about history, and um, it's a total aside. But speaking of history, you meet recently you ran into. Uh, James Watson, co-founder of, That's right. of DNA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just want to know what that... Inter- it, it was in the context of you giving a talk about uh, Schrodinger's What is Life and right. yeah. and his views on you know the gene and order from disorder, etc. So I, yeah. we don't That's have to right. go down a long road on this, but maybe you can just um, talk about the context of meeting him and then what the interaction was like. I, you had a, like a picture with no, him, I think, too, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to go down this road. Sure. This is actually what I'm currently working on, so it's the freshest in my mind. Okay. So essentially, I'm I'm engaged right now in a, a reappraisal of this really famous book, uh, showing us what is life, that is taken to be right one of the most uh, influential, well-known books of you know popular science of the 20th century. And that you claim that no one um, reads, but I've read at least a paragraph or two of it. No, no. I mean, I <laughs> so I I think that people might read it, but what what's striking to me is that so you know I was. Initially, the idea was just to write some sort of short essay commemorating the 75th anniversary of its publication, which would have been 2018, right? Um, 
And then uh, when I looked at look back at the at the book and at the argument, I noticed that uh, the argument was super interesting. The argument that Schrodinger puts forward for why he thinks that the order of the cell is based on this a priori crystal. Uh, we didn't even know that it was DNA, but you know, it turned out right. to be DNA, right? right. The, 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 the hereditary material. And you know, there's a huge amount of secondary literature on Schrodinger, like hundreds, literally hundreds of papers have been collecting, right? Uh, people, uh, even you know, on the title of the paper, you know, right. we, are, we are praising the blah 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 blah, um, <laughs> and yet no one seemed. I've only found three people <laughs> oh, wow. who actually engage right with what the argument is about, right? And so I figured, wow, this is kind of interesting. So, so I've devoted um, the last no year and a half more uh, thinking about this. I'm writing a short book, reappraising uh, this this part of the book. Right, so probably the book will be as short as the original. <laughs> Um, and um, and it's actually very interesting because uh, I think that in that argument we have and we we sort of have the key to why it is that for more than half a century molecular cell and molecular biologists have been um, sort of and in, in, in obsessed with with a particular kind of view of the cell with a sort of clockwork engineering machine view of the cell. So this is something that I've written about earlier and so doing yeah. this project a historical project by the way so it relates to what we we're talking a moment ago gives me an understanding of why it is that people think the way they do right if i if you you know i can answer your question again about why why does history matter if i didn't do this history i would i would be able to tell you why i think they're wrong right <laughs> but i wouldn't be able to tell you why it is that they think this is the standard way of thinking about the cell right why they should so think anyway, they're wrong <laughs> Why? They, they should at least understand where they're coming from. Right. You know who right. it is that came up with those ideas. That those ideas are not inevitable. You know that that, that, that nature is not telling us that we need to understand it in a machine way. Okay, and the particular choices were made at particular times that led to this research program called molecular biology that that takes for granted that this is the way the cell is. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that's why I'm motivated to 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 look at to dig into this history and understand why this the Schrodinger argued the way he did, and it's a Fascinating story, but we won't get into it. So let's to go back to Watson. So I was uh, invited to give this talk at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in uh, Long Island. At, um, you know, Watson was um, sort of president or the director for, for oh, decades, oh. and uh, he uh, lives nearby. And um, yeah, and I was there to give to give a talk on, on Schrodinger because I had been uh, looking at the archives, so I had been a fellow uh, the previous summer, So I had, because the archives of a number of really famous people were there, so Sidney Brenner, Francis Crick, James Watson also, right? So I had just been digging in the archives to find out actually uh, uh, whether, I could, whether I could find any obvious traces of evidence uh, that you know, Schrodinger's ideas had percolated into the way they were thinking about the problems they were interested in in the 1950s, 1960s, right? So anyway, I go there, go and give a talk. Uh, this was in, in a few, well, a month ago. Um, oh. And to my total s surprise, uh, James, James Watson is in the audience. But he, did, James, but he you know, was he's like 94 through Zoom, right? Or was he? No, 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 oh, he no. He there. came. They, yeah. they wheeled him in. Like he came oh, in, wow. right? He, no one had seen him, him in like since before the pandemic, right? Uh, 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 you know, he's had to. He's had some trouble because of uh, many of his unsafe reviews. You know, they, right. they renamed the School of Biology. It used oh. to be called the Watson oh. uh, School of Biology. Now it's you know they, they've been changed. Canceled. To, a, yeah, a little bit. I mean, um, perhaps with some uh, with with some justification, mm -hmm. uh, 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 given some of the views that he he, res he persistently holds, right? I mean, and people who know him have told me uh, that uh, he's never been a particularly nice guy. I mean, he was like this when he was, <laughs> you know. But anyway, okay. it's super exciting, of course, to have someone like that in the audience, right? And almost surreal because here I am giving a history talk, uh, <laughs> and it's not like super recent history. We're talking nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, right? And and in the audience is one of the main yeah. main yeah. characters of my story in the first <laughs> row, listening to what I have to say, listening, seeing the quotes that I am putting on the on the screen of him. Was, right? it, was that unnerving so it was at all? Super surreal. It was a little bit unnerving, yeah. um, and I, you know, I I normally try to do my homework, right, as it were. So I I, I try to. When I'm, I, I'm not afraid of making controversial claims. So, of course, when you do that, you need to make sure that you know that you, you, you're only, in some sense, uh, showing the tip of the iceberg of the work that you've done, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if questions come, you can always sort of justify why it is that you're saying what you're saying, right? 
if you agree with other people, it's you don't actually have to do as much work. But um, so you know, I, I knew I was I was unnerved a little bit, and I was shocked. But at the same time, I knew that it, and I knew that things were going to come. I knew that he was going to say something, right? And so I was prepared for that. But I mean, I would have liked to have known in advance because maybe I would have I would have been able to change my right. my talk and maybe maybe even make it even more provocative to get him to respond in the ways that I expected him. I didn't expect him to be there. So anyway, he was there. I gave my talk. He fell asleep a couple of times. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, understandably, sure. the guy's 94. Sure. Uh, he's the last of that generation, by the way, which is, which is quite amazing. And I don't know how long he'll be with us, but it's, it's, it was a unique opportunity. I mean, uh, he won't be around much longer. And I was quoting him uh, saying that in 1946, in 1946, he had read Schrodinger, and that's what led him to give up uh, ornithology and to turn to, to, to the study of DNA. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, that led essentially to the, to the development of molecular biology, right? And he was there, right? Anyway, I, uh, at the end of my talk, um, you know, I had some, I, I'm, the, the lesson that I'm drawing from this is that certain decisions were made uh, by the architects of molecular biology, which have not been good, right? Which have had some uh, bad consequences. And of course, he picked up on that. Mm. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, what you're saying what you're saying about us having neglected physics is crap, he said. Crap, like that. And, you know, silence in the, in the, in the audience. All the faces you know, <laughs> turned to him and then turned to me to see how it respond. So I, I actually tried to engage with him. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, I can see how you, I can, exp- I, what I said, I, I appreciate that, but I can explain if you want, I can elaborate why I, why I said that. And so I tried to... You didn't just say, no, your a, ideas were crap. And that's what you didn't just I say. Mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. laureate, you know, this yeah. is like, yeah. I, who am I? I mean, I'm, I'm nobody, right? right? So I'm I'm trying to just uh, make him understand why it is that I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, and interestingly, he uh, he retracted it. He said, well, we were dealing with... Um, I can't exactly remember his words, but it was something like... Uh, um, we had to deal with the simplest possible models. Uh, so of course we were not able to take into account everything else. And, and I said, okay, well that's, that seems reasonable. Mm. But then the next thing he said was completely unreasonable. Said, and we haven't made much more progress ever since anyway. We're still with it. And I was like, really? Um, so I was hoping to continue that conversation after the talk, uh, which is where you know, I guess the, the picture that you saw where, when it was taken when, after the, after the talkie, uh, we briefly had an exchange, but he wasn't interested. Mm. Uh, he just, uh, you know, and, he, and then he left. He left. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't even get to talk to him to ask him uh, whether he agreed with the hypothesis, you know, the hypothesis that I had proposed about, you know, how he, if he really was influenced by Schrodinger in the way that I, that I had suggested. So really odd. I mean, in some sense, a missed opportunity, but on the, on the, on the other hand, it was, um, it was really great to see him Rep, to see him voice the view that I was criticizing, oh, you know, yeah. because sometimes as a philosopher, you're worried that you are, drawing a straw man that you're caric- caric- caricaturizing your opponent's view yeah but to see watson in the flesh defending the view that i think is empirically wrong and you know presenting it and, and, and defending it and being upset by what i had said and said showed to me that i'm on the right track it showed to me that at least uh, my target is correct you know it may not be a target that reflects many people that are alive today but but it's 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 a view and it's the view that, that dominated the field for much of the latter half of the 20th century. So in that sense, it was a very gratifying experience to be able to get confirmation from one of the people who was there, one of the actors, one of the, the instrumental people. Is it worth saying the, what the view was? And, uh, or, or would that take us? Absolutely. A, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the view is, is the view that I'm saying comes from Schrodinger. It's the view that the order of the cell and, and ultimately of any multicellular organism is uh, a consequence of, uh, or is basically, is the amplification of order that already exists in in the her- hereditary substance. It's sort of this preformationist view, where you know basically what uh, you, everything is already in case right in the uh, in the uh, in this molecular substance, and and it's more than that. It's also that this substance is extremely rigid and fixed. It has to be super rigid and fixed, chemically speaking because otherwise it would be subject to the, um, you know, the disturbing effects of, of, of Brownian motion, right, of, mm-hmm. of thermal agitation. So showing the reason, right, that, that in order for um, DNA or for the hereditary substance to be able to, uh, to essentially uh, uh, store this information, even though he didn't use the word information, to store the, this information uh, over, you know, years, centuries, right, 
it had to have this incredibly solid, rigid molecular structure. A periodic okay? crystal. And, and a periodic crystal, exactly. All right. And so, and from there, he says, well, um, that order then has to be passed on to, or has to be transmitted to the proteins and, and potentially the entire cell has to, in some sense, uh, manifest the order that is already encoded in the DNA. And so the implication is that the proteins themselves also have to be rigid enough to to be to be able to to, to keep that order right and to uh, to execute the functions according to to the to the sort of the uh, the, the the program in the uh, in, in in the DNA, which by the way is another metaphor which we use all the time, genetic program, program yeah. which one can already also trace to Schrodinger, um, and. Uh, so, so I think that view is actually then I, the view that I um, that, that that I criticized in earlier work. I mean, it's a view that I think is very problematic. I mean, we shouldn't think about proteins in this way. I mean, maybe even DNA in that way, right? Proteins are plastic; they're dynamic. They don't have a rigid structure. Sometimes they don't even have a structure at all. They're completely denatured, and so they just bind to substrates and they, they then adopt a conformation. So, and that's it's fine that that wasn't known. Um, but what matters is that now that we know that, right, we need to rethink how we how order is transmitted. If it's really the case that all order is already in the DNA, we have order from order, which is Schrodinger's term, or if you have order from disorder, if order is emerging from chaos, mm -hmm. if you have like things happening, right, that enable order to uh, to emerge, right, through uh, nonlinear interactions, through self-organization, through coupling of, of, um, of disordered processes together. So, you know, it was, it's, it's a nice, it's, for me, it, it, as I say, this, this kind of work uh, 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 it gives me an understanding of why it is that those ideas uh, are still around, right, and, and also why it is that people today are very resistant to them, right? Mm. Um, it's, it's less natural for a molecular biologist to think about the cell as a physical system, as, as it's less natural for molecular biologists to think about, uh, to, to draw on what physics tells us about the cell, namely that it's a far from equilibrium steady state structure that's constantly, you know, importing energy and matter. And it's, 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 it's a process, right? Than it is to, for them to think about it as a piece of engineering. And that's very interesting because why should we think that the engineer, the engineering view reflects better this natural entity that is a mm. cell, right? Why should we think that it's normal to expect circuits with wiring diagrams to be things that we should find in the cell? It seems to me that that's, that doesn't follow at all. And the only reason why we think that way is because we've been thinking that way for a long time. We're used to thinking that way, right? So the historical work comes in in trying to work out why it is that, you know, where these ideas come from. So this is the machine conception of the organism or MCO yeah. as you abbreviate it, um, which you've written a mm -hmm. lot about. Um, and, and you blame Schrodinger? So it, no. is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I can just tell you that I, I, um, the MCO has lots and lots of different incarnations, yeah. right? Yeah. Machine metaphors yeah. come up in different contexts and evolution development. Um, in the context of the cell, molecular biology, you, you still have, I mean, I've done, I looked at the history, you, you still have appeals to machine and engineering metaphors earlier in the, the 20th century and, yeah. even, early, and yeah. even before that. But the the way we think about the cell today, I think the most the proximate cause is is this is this uh, this argument that Schrodinger uh, puts forward about determinacy. You know, he wants to have this determinate view, and the reason he wants that is because he wants to disagree with his physicist colleagues about the implications of quantum mechanics. So, you know, there are other interesting reasons about why it is that, that Schrodinger adopts this deterministic view in biology. Uh, but yeah, so of course, if you look at the MCO more generally, the machine conception of the organism, and you look at it in the context of physiology, the classic starting point is Descartes in the 17th century. Right, right, right. Well, even that is yeah. just the starting point because you can you can see yep. earlier, Paris, you know, yep. scholastic authors uh, thinking about this as well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, metaphors, they're useful. And, and I know that you regard the machine metaphor or conception of the organism as a useful metaphor. In neuroscience, the most popular metaphor is the computer metaphor for the brain. Yeah. So I don't know if you have... Maybe we can come back to that, but you've spent, uh, you've spilled a lot of ink, uh, you know, coming up with at, le at least three so far reasons why the machine conception of the organism is maybe not as useful as maybe not universally useful and should be replaced mm -hmm. with a, a processual uh, view mm -hmm. that the organism mm -hmm. is as a stream, right? So mm -hmm. I, I would love to just kind of step through the three arguments. Uh, from teleology, from thermodynamics, and from scale, and uh, yeah. and then I don't know if you have other arguments that you're working on. I know you you have this sure. other project, but 
Yeah. So no, I mean the uh, well, first of all, uh, I it's it's useful, but that doesn't mean it's it's true. I mean, right. sometimes we we uh, we conflate these, right? So it is almost the burden is on me to explain. I mean, if I'm going around telling people that this is a bad way of thinking about organisms, right? Then the first question I'm going to get is why are we still using it if it's so terrible, right? right. And so right. that's where the distinction between truth and usefulness comes in. Something can be false and yet be useful because it provides a reasonable um, approximation for particular context, right? If you're doing particular projects, uh, empirical uh, studies, then it may be helpful, right, to think about uh, muscle contraction in terms of, you know, mechanical forces, and that's all fine, right? So what matters is whether we're getting the right view overall of the of the cell or the organism. So, and there, I think, is where the, yeah. the, 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 the machine metaphor uh, breaks down. It's just inadequate. Yeah, so George P. Box is uh, often quoted as saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I suppose the, right. the same, could, you could just switch out models with metaphors in that statement. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's inevitable, right, that when you do a metaphorical redescription, the target domain, what you're redescribing, is going to be different from the source domain. Otherwise, you wouldn't be appealing to metaphors in the first place. So the, the identification is never going to be complete. Right? It's just that when a metaphor or model is very, very successful, we forget. We forget that we, that, that we actually <laughs> trans, you know, we drew on something to make sense of something else. Yeah. And just we, we see that something else to the lens of that first thing, right? Um, and and that's, that's, where the, that's, that's where the problems begin, right? When we, when we forget that. So anyway, uh, you can come up with a number of reasons why this is a, a, a a, a problematic way or a wrong way of thinking about about um, about life. Uh, the three arguments that, uh, as you say, that I've, I've put forward, um, they're not intended to be so it's not, not an exhaustive list. But um, the the basically arguments that that are also appeal to different audiences, right? So if I'm talking to mm -hmm. philosophers, it may make more sense for me to talk about teleology, you know, which is a term that is not necessarily very familiar to every scientist. If I'm talking to um, you know, to, to, to scientists, it may make more sense for me to talk about thermodynamics, right? If I'm talking to physicists or to or talk about scale, you know, I'm talking to molecular biologists, right? So that's that's where the, the that distinction comes up. It doesn't mm. mean that these arguments are completely mutually exclusive, right? One can think of the first two actually connected in some way. Yeah. So very briefly, just to, to, to outline them. So the argument from teleology, again, this is, I don't claim originality here. This is an argument that has come up in different ways since at least Kant, if not earlier, one could argue even mm -hmm. Aristotle. And it keep, keeps coming up, right? You see it in, in the work of in people like Locke, right? unexpectedly, and uh, um, you know, a, number of, a number of authors. The idea is that um, we should think about goal-directed processes in two ways. There are two kinds of teleological um, systems, ones that we can call intrinsically purposive, and others which we can call extrinsically purposive. All of that distinction amounts to is that Entities that are uh, inwardly directed, intrinsically purposive, means that uh, are those that um, where their behaviors and their operations are directed towards their own maintenance, mm -hmm. right? Um, so everything that, that when you're thinking about function, for example, in biology, uh, you can think of what each part of the system is doing as a contribution to the maintenance of the system of which it is a part, right? Yep. In that sense, it's it's contributing to its to its uh, to its maintenance, so it, it's so its own maintenance is its purpose. Okay, so organisms are that kind of system. They're systems which, which are um, you know which which um, everything that they're doing in some sense, right, can be interpreted as contributions to their own maintenance, right. Uh, whereas extrinsically purposive systems are systems whose operation are directed to ends that are outside of themselves, right. Mm -hmm. So they are they do so machines do what they do. Uh, because that benefits the maker or the user of the machine, right? Uh, your toaster, you know, cooks, heats up your bread in the morning, your slice of bread, and it does that not for itself, but because uh, <laughs> you are going, you're going to consume that bread. Or your car drives you from point A to point B. That's not in the interest of the car. That's in the interest that you are the one who is benefiting, right, um, from that operation. So in some sense, the, the, the purpose, if we can use that, that concept, of the operation of a machine is is outside of itself, right? Does that make sense? Yep. This is actually, you know, immediately connected then to the argument from thermodynamics as well. 
Absolutely. I was going was to say, exactly, right? So the reason why organisms are intrinsically purposive has to do with their peculiar thermodynamic character, the fact that they exist far from equilibrium, that they're dynamically stable, right? So the second argument has to do with, with that, with, you know, attending to what it is that physics tells us about, about organisms and machines. And what it tells us is that organisms are inherently unstable. Then they have to keep acting to keep existing, right? And so that is a very different state of affairs from the situation you find in, in, in machines where there are uh, near equilibrium conditions, which means that they can be, you can, you, can, you can use them and then you can turn them off. You know, the way I put it is that organisms don't have an off switch, right? Uh, they have to keep, keep going, right? If they stop uh, acting, they, they stop existing. It's, it's almost connected to how we think about life and death also. Thermodynamics gives us a way of thinking about what it means to die. It means to lose that sort of irreversible steady state far from equilibrium and return to equilibrium conditions. Mm. Um, whereas in the case of machines, right, um, of course, when you're using them, they, there may be exchange uh, of energy and even of matter. There may be open systems, right, um, like a car where you, you, you put in fuel and then, you know, uh, and, and, and some things come out as well. But the point is that the car doesn't stop existing when you stop using it, right? Like when you park your car at night and go home, you're not worried that in the, mo- in the morning when you wake up, the car is no longer going to be there. Whereas if you, if you forget your hamster in the... I think that's the example I, I, I have in the, in the paper. You forget your hamster in your loft. Uh, you, you won't right. have a hamster <laughs> much longer, right? right? Uh, so there's something clearly quite fundamentally different here. And, and so what I do in, this, in, in, in that paper where, I, where this is the chapter in the book where I uh, present this argument is tease out the implications. You know, what does it mean? What are the implications of us accepting that there is this fundamental difference, thermodynamically speaking, between organisms and machines? And then the final, the final argument uh, is one that s- applies specifically to appeals to machine metaphors and engineering ideas in molecular, cell and molecular biology. And the idea is quite simple. Uh, machine, the machines that we design, so the whole point of appealing to machines when we're trying to explain uh, biological phenomena is that we are supposed to understand machines quite well. I mean, we design them after all. So they're familiar entities, right? Um, and the idea is that we are going to use those familiar intuitions and project them onto something that we're less familiar that we're trying to understand, right? That's the whole point of this metaphorical uh, red, redescription of, uh, uh, that, that is involved. But the point is that when you're looking at molecular um, uh, phenomena, molecular entities, um, that transposition is going to mislead you, right? Because machine, the machines that we create exist in, the, in our macroscopic world of our everyday experience. And that macroscopic world is governed by a particular set of physical forces. Pistons you know, and gravity, ball bearings matters. and, yeah. Exactly. Everything that we think of when we think of this mechanical worldview, and, right, yep, is very yep. much our macroscopic one. And, and obviously, the world of molecules is a fundamentally different one from a physical perspective. You don't need to know any biology to know that. I mean, any physicist knows, right, that it's difficult to have directed movement from one place to another when you're a molecule because thermal agitation makes that impossible unless you're at absolute zero temperature is actually measuring that level of, of of stochasticity that exists inherently right this this thermal energy right so that means right that to think of molecular processes in a mechanical way is going to it's going to mislead us if we're not aware that the scale at which these processes are happening is so different that the physical forces that exert the greatest the greatest influence are different right so gravity is thrown out of the window doesn't really matter Inertia doesn't matter, but but for example, uh, you know, as I say, ground in motion is super important. Ele- electromagnetic sort of forces begin to matter a great deal. Uh, the the medium changes, right? So water behaves differently when you're a protein, right? You you experience water differently. Uh, it's it's like punching you, it's buffeting you. Uh, it's not a liquid. It's like um, you know, modelers and physicists when they are looking at proteins, they tend to talk about how. It, the, 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 the movement has to be understood as if you were trying to walk through molasses or yeah. through honey. You know? yeah. And these are, again, metaphors to help us understand that the di- difference in scale matters and that we just can't willy-nilly just, just, just transport you know, these, these me- you know, the engines and, all, and so on and so forth, the cogs and wheels that we, the, that we are familiar with. We can't just assume that those exist at that scale because they just couldn't. You know? uh, and so that's basically the, the, that third argument. And you, you want to replace it with a more processual metaphor, and we'll talk about yeah. process philosophy in a moment, but as a stream, I mean, 
uh, the organism as a stream. Well, first of all, is that right? Is, is that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's basically what I want to do is try to listen to attend to what physics tells us, mm -hmm. okay, instead of engineering. And what this physics tells us? Well, it tells us that organisms are flows of energy and matter. So I'm not naive enough to think that we can get away without using any metaphors, okay? Right. Even though I'm very critical of the machine metaphor, I recognize that metaphors are indispensable. And it's a good thing. It's not, I'm not saying I'm not making a normative. You know, I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's something we should be ashamed about. Metaphors we, I mean, we can have be to, extremely. We have helpful. to talk about things, so we have to use words. To. So yeah, exactly. And often, you know, words actually come up. Uh, new words are <laughs> developed or coined as a consequence of metaphorical redescriptions, right? Okay. So so I'm not. So what I'm saying is, well, okay, fine. We need metaphors, but maybe we we need to use a different set of metaphors. And maybe the time is has come when uh, perhaps we should uh, start drawing on metaphors that capture. The, the the you know the, the features of living systems that physics tells us right so in that sense the processual sort of of, of battery of mat metaphors and here I, I you know you can think of all not just streams but you know vortices flames right uh, and why these become more more valuable and in fact you know these these are usually referred to as dissipative structures by physicists right systems that are far from nuclear and organisms also right so or, so when you're describing organisms from a physical perspective, you actually don't necessarily make a distinction between between a, between an organism and a flame. You you think of when you're modeling and you're theorizing about them, they're all dissipative structures, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, it's a very sort of first approximation, and I'm the first one to admit that it's not going to capture everything. And of course, a, even more so that a lot of things that you capture with a machine metaphor, for example, functions, you know, uh, uh, hierarchical organization, is not captured with um right. with a metaphor of a flow right. right you don't have a division of labor of parts right in a in a in a in a stream or in a vortex but you do capture other things arguably other things that are even that are as or even more important right you capture the the the, the, the sort of as i say the, the the processual ontology that should lie at the heart of how we theorize about life so uh, yeah i know that you're not a neuro philosophy of neuroscience philosopher of neuroscience but so the machine conception of the organism is you know directly paralleled in the computer metaphor of the brain or, or right, yeah. the brain as an information processing system and there's been you know plenty of voices pushing back and you know suggesting replacements for the computer metaphor of the brain but it has been super useful in neuroscience and i don't i'm just curious if you have any thoughts on um, you know, if, if you've explored that literature at all and have thoughts on the computer metaphor of the brain as an information processing mm -hmm. computer. Well, I mean, the computer metaphor, I mean, I have some familiarity. I'm, 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 I'm familiar with it to some extent because the computer metaphor all, also comes up in molecular biology, right? So mm -hmm. the way we think about um, um, what happens to development, we think about it as the execution. I mean, this is the traditional view, right? The execution of a set of algorithmic right. instructions encoded in the genome. Yeah. And we, there's talk of, you know, software and hardware as you have in computers. And, you know, the software is, is the genetic material and the hardware is, is, is the embryo. And of course that doesn't really work because the idea is that the software is creating the hardware. <laughs> Obviously no computer works that way, right? right. The, the hardware has to be already assembled for the software to be able to be run on it. But anyway, the point is that that language and that, um, that all, that's already there, those metaphors, and of course, the notion of information also, right? And computability, all these things, right? Um, what matters to me when I think about these things is, again, the history, because uh, if you don't know anything about the history, right, you may say, well, you know, this is a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about the brain um, or about the cell or whatever. But when you realize that, you know, information language was brought in, under particular circumstances at a particular time, and there was nothing inevitable about it, you realize that, it, that you can't just assume, for example, that information is something that's just out there, which is what the cyberneticists and others try to argue. And many people think that way today. I mean, the information is just like matter and energy. It's just there. And I think that, again, a historical perspective allows you to, reminds you, right, that information maybe it's a useful, might be a useful metaphor, but there are some dangers in verifying it and assuming that, that the, the only way to think about what's happening and what's going on in the brain is in terms of information processing, right? It also has interesting uh, uh, problematic, potentially problematic consequences, right? The, the idea of, of computability, um, that's something that's, that's, that's been taken up by embryologists. You know, they say, well, okay, if, there's, if, there's, uh, if, there's, um, if, the, if, the, if the DNA is computing the embryo, right, then in principle, we should be able to act like the Laplacian demon and say, well, mm -hmm. if I have all the information, if I, if I know what's in the DNA and I know all the initial conditions, I should be able to compute 
determinate, perfectly deterministically the outcome, right? And, and that it, some serious uh, respected developmental biologists have made that claim, uh, but that's completely com- flies in the face of everything we know about about the, the about the process, the molecular process that are going on in in the cell. So I, I assume maybe you can you, we can have a conversation. You can tell me. I mean, that, uh, whether that's maybe that's a, that's a problem as well when you're thinking about what's going on in the brain, right? That mm. we can't as we can't assume um, first of all this deterministic outlook right where you have in the way that you have in a in a in a when you when you execute a program in a computer you can't assume that that at the molecular level that translates to something uh with the same sort of uh of of, of determinacy um i don't know what you what what what, what you tell me well no i mean it, it's interesting that you brought up dna first of all um claude shannon himself warned mm-hmm. against the use of his shannon what's now known as shannon information um, because everyone was taking it up in biology and in other fields, and he has this really nice short paper warning against that. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, you mentioned DNA, mm-hmm. and it's you know there's not enough information uh, in DNA to program all of the just the structure of the human brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. when you get down to like worms, some worms, and you know some smaller organisms, you could actually fit all of that information into the DNA. But but the connections of our brain. Uh, you know, rely on development, right? So there's a set of instructions, but then there's the developmental process, which we've talked about on the podcast before. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. so that computability doesn't exist essentially <laughs> from DNA right, to to right. the structure of our brains and, I suppose, bodies. Yeah, well, that's exactly that's exactly the same. That yeah. the conclusion that people in development are drawing yeah. uh, is exactly that. That that it may be a useful um, idealization. But what it misses is the materiality, the the substance mm-hmm. of life or of the brain. You know, it's if you think about it, these sorts of descriptions are are, are, are very sort of divorced from the materials, right? Um, I guess that's in some sense the, 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 the that's where their seduction lies. You know, that you can you can sort of uh, move it from one. The, the medium doesn't really matter, but of course, it matters a great deal, right? Uh, the the the, mat, the the stuff of life if either it's a brain or there's no stuff you know, i thought it's all processes all of that matters a great deal and and uh, it, it's it's just an exercise in abstraction to to and it might be a useful one for some purposes right to think of boolean networks for example mm-hmm. and just think of the zeros and ones and gates and logic gates and just saying well you know that, and some people have adopted that framework and when thinking about you know uh, development and i'm sure that, uh, that also uh, comes up in in the study of, of of the brain and so you know the question then is well uh, does this are you are you suggesting you can ask the person who's defending that view that this is the way that this is a useful way of, of understanding um you know is this reflecting what's actually going on you know at the molecular level mm. and my and my my suspicion is that that's where it's much harder to 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 defend those those metaphors, right? Because they they don't take scale seriously. For example, this is maybe another example, uh, you know, a, a place where um, this argument from scale that I mentioned uh, has some bearing on discussions in neuroscience. Let, let's move into talk a little bit more about process philosophy. So, you just use the word abstraction. So I, I just kind of want to bounce some ideas off of you, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. uh, around the, the notion that processes are uh, more fundamental than things, than substances. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I'll direct people to your book, Everything Flows, um, just for lots of different essays regarding uh, different uh, subjects and uh, accounts of different subjects as process uh, philosophies. But you you just use the term um, abstraction. And I was, you know, I've been thinking about processes a lot since I talked to Yogi, actually, um, Mm -hmm. a handful Mm -hmm. of episodes, and and he refers to your work a lot in his, Mm -hmm. in his own work. Um, one of the, it's I don't know if it's ironic or paradoxical, but one of the things that is considered to uh, be a fundamental aspect of our intelligence is our ability to abstract. So if the, if the mm-hmm. thing to explain from a process philosophy perspective is how things can become static, so it seems like an abstraction, a concept, a thing, um, which is what 
makes us intelligent, one of the things that makes us quote unquote intelligent is to be able to conceive of concepts as things, uh, as static mm-hmm, kind mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. entities. That it's interesting that uh, the thing that, or one of the things that makes us intelligent is uh, our ability to conceive of things <laughs> incorrectly. <laughs> That's a really, really interesting and, and uh, interesting reflection. I, I, I think that's right. It's almost paradoxical, right? That if it's if we do define intelligence that way, we could say that in the, that we demonstrate our intelligence when we transform a world of processes into a world of substances through our concepts. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure what that means, though. I, I don't know how to uh, judge it. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that. Um, Again, if we want to understand why it is that process philosophy and our process outlook has always been the minority view, we we have to uh, um, reflect on 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 the on 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 why it is that the substance view is is so much more familiar to us, mm-hmm. and surely that part of the answer or part of the story there is going to have to do with with our cognitive apparatus, with how we perceive the world, with how we reason, with the language, with, with how we use language, right? So it's almost as if the, our entire disposition or everything about us is, is geared towards thinking in terms of substances because that's easier and that, that makes better sense of the world around us. But, and I guess that is why, the, well, one reason why the process view is, seems to us counterintuitive, why it seems unfamiliar, even though, and here's the argument, you know, it, that is, I think, the view that the science is giving us of the world. So the mm-hmm. science, natural science is telling us, it's not just biology, by the way, physics, chemistry, is telling us that the world is dynamic and processual through and through, all the way down. And yet the way we think, the way we use language, the way we use concepts, everything is, is <laughs> based on this other it's, metaphysics. We're built right? so that maybe way. Yeah, we're, we're going against yeah, the yeah. grain, almost, in that sense. Yeah, I mean, all of what you said, maybe the what makes us intelligent is the ability to, uh, to, to in some sense, abstract from the dynamic... And, uh, and 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 find points of that, that stay the same of stasis that enable us to to keep track of what's going on. Uh, but, but the that, result that then the... the result would be creating a false ontology. Yeah, <laughs> one that we have to resist. Right, yeah. I, I resist. <laughs> one that, that yeah. <laughs> uh, thankfully science itself can. Uh... I mean, look, I would be. I would not be defending this view if it was just some sort of exercise in armchair theorizing. Right. Okay, the whole reason why I think this is a very compelling view is because it's the view that I think we should we should um, embrace if we take the findings of natural science seriously. Mm. Right? This is a this is a metaphysics. It's true, and this scares lots of people. Yeah. But it's a metaphysics that is grounded in science. It's not it's not armchair metaphysics or based on intuitions that you may have or when you're meditating, you know, by the fire. It's it's something. It's it's basically. Let's work out what view of the world we should have if we if we take seriously the findings of science. Hmm. And uh, we happen to focus on biology, but as I say, I mean, a hundred years earlier, people like Whitehead came to the same conclusions when looking at physics. So, in some sense, the revolution in biology is overdue, right? And many of these organisms that I mentioned at the beginning of the of our discussion, we're already aware of this. In the 1920s, we're already talking about organisms as, as processes. They realize that this is the way to think about them. Again, that's another reason why the history there is useful. So, so yeah, it, it, it may seem like uh, a lot to take in, right? And as I say, <laughs> sometimes scientists are not, are not uh, very happy with this word metaphysics. It seems to not have the right connotations. But you can think of metaphysics also on a continuum with science. You know, metaphysics is, is not fundamentally different. I mean, if you think about science as the enterprise that we engage in when we want to find out what the world is like, that's also what metaphysics is doing. It's just doing it at a, at a higher level of abstraction, you know? Hmm. And so surely if that's the case, then metaphysics has to be grounded or there has to be some dialectical relationship between science and metaphysics, right? One has to inform the other all the time. And of course that means that if science changes, you know, we should be prepared to, to change also our metaphysical conclusions, hmm. right? Um, which of course metaphysicians are not necessarily... Uh, inclined to do. I mean, they, when when I was presenting this stuff, again, this, the, the the target audience mattered a great deal. So, when we presented this kind of work to audiences where there were metaphysicians in the room, they were, you know, they were like, "Why you care so much about science? You know, why, you know, we use your intuitions, you know." <laughs> and there's a, a very different sort of tradition in analytic metaphysics that doesn't necessarily take 
the financial sciences as that important because they can change, right? Um, so yeah, uh, and then and then you know you talk to scientists and you get the opposite problem. You know, well, metaphysics. Well, why? Who cares? Why are yeah. you drawing those sorts of conclusions? Yeah, yeah. So so um, it, it struck me that there's a, a current kind of trend in neuroscience and computational neuroscience that lends itself well to a process perspective, and that is the idea of computation through dynamics. So when you're recording, when you're looking at the activity of a large population of neurons, you can reduce the dimensionality. Um, so if you have a thousand neurons, that's a thousand dimensions, right, of activity. But if you can reduce the dimensionality uh, according to the variance um, of, of the population of neurons, and then what you see is this trajectory in this lower dimensional space along, often along a manifold, some sort of shape, uh -huh. right? Some sort of low right. dimensional shape. And um, there's a trend in recently in thinking of cognitive uh, functions as these sort of uh, trajectories along these manifolds, which is a very dynamical and process oriented mm -hmm. perspective. So I, mm. I, I don't know that neuroscience is a writ large is aware that that's a sort of a processual uh, mm, view. That's super interesting. Yeah. It sounds a bit like dynamical systems theory. Is it it the, is. The it's directly from dynamical systems okay, theory. Okay, yeah, okay, it's okay. using the tools yeah. of dynamical systems theory to analyze these pop high dimensional right, populations right. of neurons. So, um, yeah, I mean there are similar um, approaches. Not not part of the mainstream, but you can find them historically. You know, f proposed and then forgotten, yeah. uh, but available to anyone who cares to look. Of people who try to, for example, think of development in this way, uh, instead of thinking about genes being switched on and switched off, static things, yeah. thinking about patterns and uh, dynamic flows and, and the stability. You know, for example, um, we have this notion of homeostasis, right, mm -hmm. in physiology. Um, Waddington, one of these developmental biologists, also an organicist, by the way, but someone who actually tried to, perhaps the one that's been least forgotten. Some, most people know who Waddington is. Huh. He uh, he came up with this notion of homeoresis. Homeoresis as a contra, sort of as a as the other side of the coin of homeostasis. And homeoresis is not um, not st not sort of um, uh, stability around a, a particular uh, variable, but actually stability across time. Mm. Right. That when you look at Development in many processes, they are, they are stable temporarily, meaning that they are able to compensate against perturbations and keep the same sort of trajectory paths, right? So it's, it's you know, and what Wellington was very much in, uh, inspired by Whitehead, right? And what you see in his, in his theorizing is this idea that you were just describing, where you focus more on patterns, right, on things that are dynamic, instead of the individual entities, which would, are deemed to be less important. But, but the pattern through time is a process view of identity, right? Yeah, that's right. So that's how we think about identity, right? So if you want to think about why something stays the same across time, you think about what's how it's being maintained about the, you know, you you think about it, you think, of, I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable, if you if you take the time seriously, and if you don't, <laughs> I mean, in some sense, pro process thinking is a consequence of taking time seriously, right? Right? right. Uh, we just we're just not very good at taking time seriously. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, at any moment in time, you you are just a time slice of the person that you are, right? You are extended in time. And so uh, to if you want to understand, say, an organism, you need to look at the entire life cycle of the organism. Uh, it, it reflects through time. It's just that when you're looking at a particular, when you're looking at any entity at a particular time, you're just dealing with one instance, right? With a temporal part, to use a metaphysician's term. And, and that's a interesting uh, locution because you can start thinking about parts temporally in the way that we think about parts spatially so mm -hmm. in the same way that your arm and your head are parts of you you can think of you the you of yesterday and the you of today as, as also parts of you temporal yeah. parts interesting and if you take that seriously that idea then it means obviously that you need to consider the the whole and the whole in this context is not is not you at any moment but the, the you across time so again, you always have lingering at the back of your mind that scientist question of how am I going to translate this into how does this help me right in uh, in my work? Because obviously, it's really difficult, right, to to study anything across uh, across the entire duration of its existence, right? Uh, uh, most of the techniques and tools that we use in science Slice. are meant yeah. to, yeah. If you think about it, yeah. that's what we're doing. We're always working with time slices, and we are expect that we can abstract the entire process on the basis of these snapshots, mm -hmm. you know, like a movie. Uh, this is an aside, but you don't favor looking too much to Alfred North 
Whitehead, um, which a lot of people appeal to him as sort of an originator of a process philosophy. But is it because he uh, used a bunch of neologisms, made up a, a bunch of unnecessary words, or is his process philosophy the incorrect process philosophy? Um, I mean, he he is the person that nowadays, for better or for worse, is people think of when when you say the the phrase, you know, process philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are good reasons for it, right? He was the person perhaps who most systematically developed a, uh, a process view. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason why I'm not, I'm not a Whiteheadian is because <laughs> I don't think that he exhausts, I think that process thinking can exist uh, beyond what White had happened to say about processes, mm. right? Mm. He offered one proposal and, um, it's fine. I mean, uh, but you know, when I when I looked at it, and when you know, I did this 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 postdoc, I was part of this project with John Dupre at Exeter on process. We actually tried to read process and reality. We didn't get very far. <laughs> well, why? I mean, is it really the, is the effort effort worth it? Right. Uh, when you talk to Whiteheadians, you talk to processual thinkers who are Whiteheadians. They live in Whitehead's framework. You know, they. And they disagree exegetically about what white had meant by certain categories and by certain terms. And I'm like, that's not my project. That's fine if you want to do that. I care about 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 a science. I care about a view, what view we need of the world that makes sense of the science that I care about. Right. So it's still processual, but you know, I don't have to avail <laughs> myself of the of these terms and this way of thinking. And and that's that's one reason I can give you many more. I mean, he. His view is not really totally, actually, fully processual. He believes in these sort of actual occasions that that are the atoms of the of his of the processes that he suggests. You know, he has also uh, it's a, it's a metaphysics that that is not particularly naturalistic, right? It's not conforming with science. There's God. There's a the, there's a process theology, and you know, you process thinking is already hard enough. To, for scientists to accept you don't want to make your work even harder yeah. by saying no yeah. if you want to accept what i'm saying not only do you have to accept that the world is dynamic but you also have to learn and read this opaque prose by this uh, early 20th century author uh, but that is not to say that the history is not relevant in fact uh, you know if you when you i'm sure you saw that when i after discussing white i would go on to discuss these these biologists that were inspired by white right. and i said well actually those people have all the the way they translated the, that thinking turns out to be much more helpful for me than the thinking of the of the master, as it were, right? So second order Whiteheadian, maybe, I don't know. But yeah. the point is that, yeah, there's more than one way to be a processual philosopher. That's what I would say. Uh, it was interesting. It made me remember uh, when I was in an undergraduate, I, th I was taking some literature course. Uh, I think we read um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez or something. Anyway, the professor was, he, he did his thesis, I suppose, on Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, being in nothingness. And I was really right. into existentialism at the time because I was young, you know, and I tracked him down and I was like, sure, because I, it's such a thick tome, that book. And I'd read a bunch of other peripheral uh, works by Sartre and other existentialists. And I asked him, should I read being in nothingness? And he said, no, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> clearly not, he, even though he did his thesis on it, you know, so maybe, maybe it's uh, similar to your Whitehead experience. Okay, I have two more process uh, questions for you. One, I had this yeah. fleeting moment in the gym uh, a few weeks ago <clears throat> where I was thinking about uh, consciousness and our minds and our subjective experience. And I thought, could it be like acceleration is a process on top of velocity, which is a process, right? So it's a process of a process. Is there any fruit in thinking of consciousness? And I know this is maybe just a silly non-starter, but of thinking of consciousness as sort of a process of a process, right? Of a su subjective experience as a process of our brain processes. So what would be the underlying process in that, in that case? The brain activity would be its own process, oh, right? That, okay. okay. And, and, and then, then consciousness on top of that. On top of that. Is, is it yeah. odd to think of hierarchical structures of processes? No, no, that's how I think we should think about processes. Otherwise, you don't, can't get very far. If you think that there's this one process, right? You need to right, right. make certain distinctions, right? So the idea, so, okay. Um, okay, well, just- I don't know how to get, I don't know how to move forward from it. So I want Let, you, let's I want see, your help. Let's see if we yeah. can. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, let's talk about hierarchies of processes. So you can think of, you can think of 
say the biological world as one huge process, right? But mm-hmm. then within it, you can find different um, processes within that, which you can identify because they have different time scales, which mm-hmm. the turnover rates are different. So think of, uh, think of, think of yourself, right? So you, um, you are made up of, of organs. The organs are made up of tissues. The tissues are made up of cells. The cells are made up of molecules. And at each of those levels, slow, slow, slower, you are slower. having energy. Yeah. That, you know, the, 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 the turnover is faster as you go down, yeah. actually, right? Yeah. Um, and you can also even have the level of a population, right? So at the population level, um, everything, looks, everything looks the same, but if you look, the, the individuals come and go, right? Mm-hmm. In the same way, when you look at the, the individual, you stay the same, but then, you know, your cells are constantly coming and going. And if you, again, if you look at one of your cells, the cell stays the same, but the molecules are constantly um, turning over, right? So in that sense, it, it's, it seems perfectly reasonable to be able to objectively, it's not something that the uh, observer imposes on the reality, but you can objectively identify scales or levels, right, of, of, of processual change. Um, and you don't actually need to assume that the fundamental level, even if there is one, I mean, you might not even have to assume there's a fundamental level, is, sub- is, is substances. You, know, you can just say that the pro- process is all the way down, turtles all the way down. Right, right. right. And that every time you identify substances or you see, of course, you rely on substances oh. to some extent, so, you're saying, well, you know, the substances are instantiations of those processes or they are maintained actively by means of the processes above and below them. It's right? a slower The reason why cell, cells yeah. seem stable is because the, you know, the hep- hepatocyte is maintained by processes above it in the liver and also by processes below it, by, the, by all the sort of molecular uh, entities that, 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 that are doing, doing things for the cell to maintain itself. So, so I think hierarchies are completely reasonable in a perceptual view. Um, the worry I have, not worry, but the, the difficulty I have with uh, thinking about consciousness is that it's not obvious to me what it is. Yeah, right? I know. Uh, That's the, always the problem. <laughs> see you know i was thinking when we when we had this correspondence uh, by email and you were, we were talking about what we we're going to t- you were saying what we we're going to talk about and i and i was like okay why i i, I was thinking i've been thinking about why it is that i don't have a great deal to say about about you know consciousness in the Minds, mind and, and the yeah. reason yeah. the reason i think uh is, is is that it's too hard it's just it's too difficult i mean <laughs> really i mean i i don't i i don't understand paul how people like you are able to devote their time to thinking about such hard problems you know but it's I, the, the I, problem I, is i don't and that's the problem is i would like to but it's out of my reach you know and that i think it's just been out of reach for everyone forever but i mean so what's the motivation to get up in the morning and and work on such a hugely difficult intractable problem i mean but i don't let me, let me i want you to figure right, it out okay, i want but, you to solve the mind brain problem <laughs> but you know I, the reason why you know so, so if i ask myself why it is that i'm more interested in life than i am in mind right mm-hmm. it's a reasonable question mm-hmm. which is what i've been asking myself since we've since we've been uh corresponding interesting the answer has to be that when i set my eyes you know on the horizon of trying to work out what life is i guess that seemed to me even though it's an extremely difficult problem within you know not within my reach but something that i can i Make, i hope yeah. make some progress over the course of yeah. my life yeah. right uh, a problem that we can begin to illuminate over decades and decades of hard work whereas and so that is already that helps me motivate me because i feel like okay my work is not completely useless because maybe i can help illuminate it but when i think about the mind which of course is the next frontier, right? Mm-hmm. It's so beyond what I can even hope to, that <laughs> I, I couldn't possibly motivate myself to work on a topic like this. And I guess that's why I never thought about this before, but this just came up to me when I was, th- you know, in the last two days. Maybe that's the reason why I inherently have avoided looking at questions of, in, about mind and consciousness, because as your question illustrates about consciousness, we just know so little. Yeah. Our knowledge is so primitive. I mean, I did take a couple of courses on uh, cellular uh, neurobiology i looked you know and, and I, we know so little i mean it's so primitive our, our scientific understanding of what's going on it's so primitive that i it's almost hopeless but of course if everyone thought the way that i did we would never make any progress so obviously yeah. some people need to do this work i just, I just don't want to be one of them right <laughs> but, but yeah I, I i think that the motivation is just that it's such a miraculous thing that we have that it feels like anything to be a process let's say you know so that it's just it's a fundamental mystery so but yeah you reach and there's nothing to grab there's really nothing to grab so yeah it, so, it seems 
uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, there's nothing to grab then. Um, it, it's almost as if, well, not anything goes, but there, there's going to be a great, a great range, I guess, of possible <laughs> hypotheses because it's yeah. difficult to know which, which one which one we can reject, right? So, again, I mean, I applaud and I admire people, who, you know, scientists <laughs> and philosophers people. who are looking at these questions yeah. because I just, I don't have the... Uh, I don't have the nerve. I, I don't have the, 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 the person, the temperament to be able to uh, motivate myself to work on something so difficult as consciousness and mind. I mean, and also, you know, if you ask me a question like that, it just almost seems irresponsible of me right. to try to answer because it's so difficult. So what you're saying is that you agree that consciousness is a process of a process of a process. <laughs> I think if that's what I don't that's what we... <laughs> see any reason not to, um, you know, pursue not that? to, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not to pursue it. That's All right, but we're not going to solve it today. What about, uh, so <laughs> here, here's my, my last um, uh, process question for you. How to think about the Big Bang in terms of process? Or is it not, you know, because that's a singularity, right? And I remember seeing mm. like a picture of the mm. size of the corpuscle that was the Big Bang, mm. you know, relative to an mm. ant. And it's like a little ball, right. which is a thing, right? Yeah. So how do we, is, is it worth even thinking about that from a wow, process uh, great question great question i i don't know i mean um well i guess so the issue is how do you make sense of of an event that has a beginning from a processual perspective is that the idea yeah um well i mean one could one could take the easy way out and say well the very notion of time did not exist before the beginning yes of that the, would of that's the what i thought you'd say a, yeah it's a bit of a cop-out right because you're saying well you know that Nothing question existed. makes no right. sense right uh because time uh it begins when that happens, so there is no such thing as before. But we do think of it um, as a little ball of all of the mass and energy and whatever else. That's right. Yeah, we can. Move yeah, on. it's. I mean, yeah. it, it's. No, no. I, so I'll tell you something about that. I mean, maybe maybe we can go somewhere with this. Um, has it? I mean, has it occurred to you? Occurred to you that? I mean, that it's not inevitable for us to think that the universe has a beginning, right? right. That for centuries, uh, many people thought that it, actually that was a silly thing to think, right? That it made sense to think that there's always been, um, we're not talking, so of course we're talking people who don't believe in creation. So, we're, mm -hmm. you know, of course, because creation, the, the, the theological narrative has a beginning. And I, and I guess that's why many, many people who believe in that secretly were satisfied when, you know, scientists, physicists start you know, propose the Big Bang Theory and start thinking, well, you know, maybe the universe has a beginning because at least it aligns with this notion of a beginning. But the alternative, which was, which was defended by many people in ancient Greece and, you know, many authors, atheist thinkers, is a very interesting one, right? The way you don't have a beginning. It's one that we nowadays find difficult to even make sense of, right? It doesn't make sense, yeah. But, uh, but you know, if, you, if, if the universe has already, has always existed, um, I wonder... Yeah, I but mean, I wonder whether that is some. Uh, uh, but how can you have you something out of nothing? <laughs> That's the. Well, the the idea would be that there has always been something. So there's uh, always kind infinity, of been nothing as well. I, there's no difference then, I suppose. All right, we're really gonna. <laughs> no, no, it's it's. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> It's an interesting okay. question to ask. All right. Anyway, yeah. um, I'd like to ask you about artificial intelligence, of which I know that in our in our little correspondence you were very resistant because you, you don't, um, you know, you're not an AI expert or anything. And then if you have time, I'd like to ask you about your interest in artificial life. So, mm -hmm. um, I, given your, uh, the, you know, your view of organisms as streams, right. As processes, uh, you know, my, I guess the question is, what does that say about using a computer or something, you know, to, to model artificial quote unquote intelligence, well, I guess what I want to connect is the idea of the organism and life with the idea of intelligence and whether intelligence, which is also another uh, fuzzy term, mm -hmm. ill-defined, um, whether we should think of intelligence as something that is inherently connected to life or, you know, the idea of artificial intelligence in general is these days modeling, trying to model human uh, intelligence and Mm -hmm. Our fancy, our because we're the most intelligent things in the universe, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but should we? Sh do we need to change our notion of intelligence when we're talking about uh, something that we're programming a computer to do, even if it learns? Mm -hmm. But a computer has no autonomy; it has no self-organization. Has it's not mm -hmm. far from thermal. Um, there's no far from thermal equilibrium mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just wanted to get your kind of overarching view on, on artificial intelligence and how to think of it yeah. given the machine no, I mean, the, reason, the, the reason why i was 
Yeah, I mean, the reason why I was resistant is because I don't know much, and I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> speak about well, things. I, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. but I'll, I'll I'll give you my uh, my two cents. I mean, I think that, um, and I think that what the ex- attempts to, for example, um, think about biological processes or psychological processes in silico are, are going are making a number of assumptions which which how we have to test we don't have to accept right that um, again this relates to what we talked about before that the process can be abstracted from the material uh, that instantiates it mm-hmm. right if, mm-hmm. if, if one thinks that we can recreate what it means to be intelligent in a machine uh, what it means for it, for it to have an intelligence that just resembles ours then we are making that sort of assumption and and I think that that's uh, that's problematic. I mean, uh, the if you think of a, of, of uh, the classic, most famous attempts or examples of AI. I mean, I, I don't know much about this, but I know, for example, of the of Deep Blue, the classic you mm-hmm. know, uh, situation, right? When we had this computer that was able for the first time to defeat our best chess player at chess, right? That seems like a great accomplishment of AI. But the question is, you know, what do we draw from that? What conclusions do we draw? Do we draw the conclusion that the uh, that the uh, the computer uh, reasons the way that a human reasons when they play chess and they reason better. Well, clearly no, right? Because the computer is is, is computing, is considering all these different uh, chess moves, right? Millions and millions and millions, and yeah. clearly that's not how the human mind works, right? The human mind, I guess, well, I don't know much about chess, but presumably, you know, uses intuition and and a number Heuristics. of other factors come in, right? Yep. Heuristics, or you know, uh, so that's clearly not a conclusion that you can draw from that event when Deep Blue uh, defeated Kasparov. So what can you say? Can you say that the computer is smarter than Kasparov because it defeated him uh, at chess? Well, again, there. Is, uh, what do we mean by smart? Do we are we talking again about computability? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe in that sense, yes. But uh, we, I think, tend to think about intelligence as something more than that, right? There are going to be aspects to intelligence, creativity imagination, ability for abstract thought that are not necessarily captured by the computing power of a, comp- of a machine, right? So again, my, I have nothing against AI, but surely what, what we need to be careful about is what we conclude. What, what do we think we are licensed to conclude from those sorts of events, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I, don't, I don't know the literature well enough to know what it is that people thought we had accomplished by defeating humans by, by creating maybe maybe you can tell me i mean what was the conclusion from well, that deep, sort of yeah deep event? blue would be the wrong example a, a more um, okay. appropriate example for these days is something like alpha go or alpha zero um out of deep mind which <laughs> of course it's always in the game's domain uh beat the um world champion go uh player uh-huh. but it, it was okay. trained by um essentially playing itself over and over the, the most recent uh-huh. celebrated version you know you, you you have to train the model, but it trained itself by playing itself in Go over and over. I mean, it has a built-in architecture, but as it's training, it's changing its weights and stuff like that. And um, I mean, it's a you know big, complicated model. But so so that is a scale that is uh, it's a really large scale, and and wasn't and it's not necessarily modeling the brain or our intelligence, right? It's it's just uh, given a task and. Um, trained to, to do that task. However, a lot of what we talk about on this podcast is using those kinds of models as models of our brain activity and our cognitive mm-hmm. function. And there's been a lot of progress um, in that. And mm-hmm. and from a process, uh, thinking about it from a process perspective, there se- you know there would be something missing. You're not capturing the, the actual process process of nature of our intelligence by using a machine that you can walk away from for a hundred years. You come back, your hamster right. is dead, but the machine you can just turn back on, right? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. I, I, so I'm, you know, I don't have conclusive thoughts about this, which is why I wanted to ask you about it. If if there, you agree that there's just, you know, what would be missing from using a, an AI model as a model of our brain and cognitive processing? You know, it depends on on what the what the uh, the reason is for doing it in the first place, what the motivation is. Mm-hmm. If if we want super, if we want machines to 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 conduct extremely <laughs> difficult tasks that it would take a human ages to calculate, then then there's no reason to there's a good reason to fund this kind of research. Sure. The issues only emerge, I think, when 
when the intention is to draw certain scientific conclusions, mm -hmm. when it's not just a technological feat that we're after. Right. Right. Well, that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm yeah, asking about is right. the, the, you know, using yeah, yeah. artificial intelligence in the pursuit of right, understanding right. natural intelligence. I think there is where one has to uh, step in and say, well, uh, <laughs> step in. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, and say, well, I mean, are we, what, to what extent can we say that this, that, that this system is embodying, um, well, first of all, it's embodying the same sort of behaviors that we can manifest to our intelligence, but that may be easier than if it's causally, right? If the mechanisms, of course, the, 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 the means by which computers do what they do and behave intelligently are going to be fundamentally different from the way that we do it, right? Because they don't have a brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the circuits are going to be of a very different nature. So surely that's, all, that's already, that's an easy answer, right? So we're not going to learn about the intricacies of brain function by looking at, by, by devising these AI uh, uh you know systems because they don't work in the same way maybe at the functional level there are some similarities but if you're interested in the, in the causes or right, how things mm -hmm. happen surely there's a there's a this analogy there so that's one one thing that one could say um and it's a very simple reason why i mean we the, the matter of life is is uh is organic and uh it's 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 just different i mean as you, as you said physically speaking it's uh it's uh exists in a different sort of uh situation right thermodynamically speaking than than uh than in silico systems, right? They're obviously fundamentally different. And, and I guess that's also what a chemist would want to say, right? I mean, the chemistry and I think matters to, to, that's why I'm also, I mean, this also applies to people talking about organization in the abstract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that I really like the work of people like, uh, I noticed that you mentioned this in your conversation with Yogi, uh, Alvaro Moreno and Matteo Mosio, they're both yeah. friends of mine. I love book. their work. Great you know, book that they, yeah. Uh, that's all great stuff. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that they have tried to do in comparison to the earlier sort of autopoiesis uh, tradition of Varela and Maturana was to, and, and, I, and, I, and yet I don't think they do it, you know, <laughs> they don't do it enough, is to show that any conversation of organization has to be grounded in, 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 it can't be too abstract. We can't just talk about organization on its own because it's not, we're not going to get very far. First of all, the, the scientists are not going to be that interested because it's too abstract. Secondly, we're still in a situation where we don't know really what we're talking about. Right? <laughs> and I think those same concerns exist probably much more magnified by many, many times in the discussions of intelligence, right? We need, what is it that our goal is? If our goal is what you said and try to illuminate Psycho the, the psychological processes and 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 and, and our cognitive capacities. Then surely, um, there's very little. Presumably, one can uh, mm. one can derive or draw from from these sorts of models. I would say. Interesting. Um, so the most recent um, celebration in AI are these what are known as foundation models or large language models. Have you heard of these? No. The, like GPT three and uh, Palm, and there's these really giant models that you can just um, give a prompt to. Um, right. some text and they'll generate a story based on like a question that you ask it or or if wow. I gave like your name and the name of your book and asked asked it to write a summary it would generate some summary uh, of, uh -huh. wow. of the book probably because it's been trained on Wikipedia and Reddit and uh -huh. you know the uh -huh. corpus of um, the entire internet but mm -hmm. uh, the, because of that success I mean these are based on words right which are tokens that then are vectorized into sub-symbolic um, structures uh -huh. but uh -huh. uh, you know, we used to, uh, we think that um, we're special because of our ability to um, generate language, right? And un generate and understand language. And words are traditionally thought of as symbols. And then, mm -hmm. so then I thought, uh, how, do, how to think about language and perhaps symbols in a processual manner. And mm. I, I don't know if mm -hmm. you have thought mm -hmm. about this, but, but this, go, you know, mm. harkens back to the, the concept of abstraction that we were talking about before and intelligence. And part, that's part of our t intelligence is to be able to abstract and create a concept or and or a symbol so i don't know if you, if, if you just have thoughts about that i just want to wow, throw it that's you. super interesting I, I i don't have much to say i mean I, what i would say one thing i can say is that abstraction really matters in process thinking because it's the way for you to make sense of what everyone else thinks is going on right so everyone else thinks what? the world is substance is made up of things oh right right right, right. um <laughs> so abstraction is your tool to in some sense save the phenomena you know to say well you know uh, what you think is going on is actually a product of what Whitehead called the uh, fallacy of misplaced concreteness. This right, it's this famous phrase. The mouthful, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so the idea there is that you, uh, yeah, you, you take something uh, that is actually dynamic, you take it to be concrete uh, because 
for, for heuristic reasons, it's helpful too. But, but in the and case, then you forgot that that was the case. Yeah, but in the case of the material world, you can think of a rock just as a super slow process, right? That's but right. Then, that's but, right. So the point is that yeah. at the yeah at the material level, everything is processual. At the conceptual level, and in for certain experimental contexts, things have to become thing-like, right? Mm. And that's the actual of, of abstraction. But if you, we didn't do any abstraction, we were just talking about the world, there would be no reason, mm. essentially, to uh, to adopt a substance view, right? Everything would just look like processes that are stabilized at different time scales, and that they uh, they seem to be stable only to an observer looking upon that, upon that thing at a particular time. So then, you what's know, a so concept? Rocks is a good example. Yeah. So, so so then, what is a concept or a symbol? How, is it a super 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 slow process, or is do we need? Well, to no, I guess I guess concepts can be just because they're abstractions. They don't have to reflect reality, right? Uh, a concept you can just say a concept is whatever I want it to be, and I'm going to take as my concept something that doesn't change. That's how I define it. So it's analytically true that that's what the concept is because I'm defining it that way. The question is not that. The question is whether how well that uh, corresponds to what's going on, or how useful it is. And I'm not, you know, and I'm very happy to concede. I know it's useful. I mean, we're doing it all the time. Um, it's useful to to br- project onto reality these <laughs> idealizations, these things that we know are not right, because for certain contexts it's good enough. It's like a uh, discussion of Newtonian mechanics and and general, and general relativity. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we can do very well. Engineers. Designing bridges can just uh, appeal to to classical mechanics without having to worry about uh, about no without having to worry that that framework isn't strictly speaking right, you know. Um, so we could think about the, the the substance view in that same way. It's an approximation to reality, and it's a perfectly serviceable one hmm. in certain contexts. But remember, the metaphysicians care about the big questions. Okay, what is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate yeah. nature of reality? Yeah. You know? Yeah. When is um? What's the title of the what is life book? Is it what is what is life? That'd be a good title. Or is what, <laughs> what is life? It's just going to be what is life revisited. Oh, revisited. Oh, I like what is yeah. what is life. <laughs> what is what is life? <laughs> and what? Yeah, it I needs- mean, I guess it's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer because it's. I mean, Schrodinger wasn't writing about life. He was, you know, you know what I'm saying. Like the yeah. title is a very savvy and re- easy to remember, but it's it's not a book about life. It's a book about yeah. you know genes yeah. and the cell. So. So if I title my book, What is Life Revisited, I'm, I'm concerned people are also going to think that I'm addressing the sort of question that we're discussing right now, which yeah. I'm leaving for the future. Yeah. And then the, the subtitle could be, I met James Watson and told him all his work was crap. <laughs> <laughs> After he, t- he told me. He told yeah, me. Yeah, that I, yeah. I, I was actually <laughs> thinking of maybe including that in a footnote. You, you know, totally just, uh, should. You totally should, because the, the that's a momentous thing. Watson. Yeah. <laughs> It's all you have to say. It's all crap. Also, that's what he said. Dan, this has been a ton of fun for me, and I could go on and on. But um, I, I've really enjoyed reading your work, and uh, I look forward to more of it. So, when you do, when you're ready to publish that, uh, what is life revisited book? Uh, if yeah. you want to come and talk about it and and get the word I, out, I let me it. know, and, and we'll Absolutely. have you back on. Okay, I will. Right. Thank right. you. That has been so much fun. Thanks so much, Paul, again for inviting me. It's been great. It's wonderful to think about these things, and and your questions have been really, really well posed and intriguing, and making me. <laughs> Think about things in different ways. So I really appreciate (laughs) that. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. All right. Sounds good. I alone produce Brain Inspired. If you value this podcast, consider supporting it through Patreon to access full versions of all the episodes and to join our Discord community. Or if you want to learn more about the intersection of neuroscience and AI, consider signing up for my online course, NeuroAI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence. Go to braininspired.co to learn more. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. You're hearing music by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you, thank you for your support. See you next time.